To go with Charles Manson, he was saying that he had a, a being or he had some understanding on what the devil was going to be doing. But I mean, granted, someone that's satanic like he was, maybe he did have a little extra news coming in from his father. But anyway, we're going to be talking about the will of Satan. And uh, the first thing I want to do, I, I want to thank again, I can't thank enough, but all the labor of love, the people making the food and preparation and getting all these logistics together, I can only imagine how much work it is. So I wanted to read a verse, if you want to read it with me, over in Hebrews chapter number 6, an interdispensational principle. But in, in Hebrews 6, and we'll start with verse number 10, it says... For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. Now, even just the ministry of just preparing the food, I can only imagine Esau would have sold his birthright out 50 times over for the meals that we've been enjoying. I mean, they can flat out, we could be growing in the lard and in the Lord here with me. so much great food. Battery may be dying on this. Oh, okay. In which case, we'll just keep the other ones. Okay. All right, but I definitely am thankful. It's a, it's an honor and a privilege to be here, and the singing, even just the opportunity to be unplugged. Well, what was happening with Iran or Syria? I don't know. And you know what? It didn't matter. But being plugged into this book, fortifying ourselves. And a lot of times you might think that, oh, well, right now in America we may have flower beds of bees, and I must admit we do. But it may not be that way for very long, and we need to be able to fortify ourselves and prepare ourselves, just like Job. Long before he knew that there was something going on up in the heavens regarding Job, should I just preach extra loud? But far before he even had an inkling that maybe all of his children would be wiped out, he'd lose every physical possession that he only physically owned. Long before that, he was understanding and communing with God and esteeming the words of God's mouth more than his necessary food. He esteemed it so highly, and that's why Satan comes and God says to him, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And what came out of his mouth, a perfect man and upright, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. He says, Here is my showpiece, here's my masterpiece is Job, one that feared God and eschewed evil and esteemed the words of God's mouth more than his necessary food. And here came wave after wave after billow of hard times that maybe some of us may know a little bit of, but a lot of us don't even have a clue about what it would be like to go through something like that. And Job comes through tried, but like gold, he comes through. And if you remember back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, here comes that fire and that trial comes through. And what makes it through the other side? The gold, the silver, and the precious stones makes it through. So I would recommend, and the message is going to be a little bit about how to prepare yourself, what Satan's will is, how to be prepared to be able to function in opposition with Satan's will being implemented, but how we can come forth as gold on the other side and having that wisdom and understanding of, understanding of God's word working resident in us coming out through us, and through that judgment can come through the gold, silver, and precious stones and radiate praise and glory that Jesus Christ deserves every bit of it, and you'll be able to receive that to the maximum extent. All right, we'll open with a word of prayer, and then we'll start running through the scriptures. Lord, we sure do thank you for your word. Thank you for the strengthening. Thank you for the edification, and thank you for the correction that it can give us. We are so grateful that you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And thank you for saints that help encourage us. But most of all, thank you for your word that gives us that direction by which we can chart our course to those heavenly places and have a successful time and a performance time of the things that you've given us. For Christ's sake we pray and thank you. Amen. All right. I, um, I was going through at our assembly, going through Titus. And how important it is in assemblies to have aged women and aged men. But if you think about it, aged men, what is an aged man before he's an aged man? He's not an aged man. He's a young man. He's a little teeny baby, maybe walking around in diapers. And what Satan wants to do, he wants to load up, target those little guys before they even have a chance to launch off in the pad and snipe them off one at a time. And that's what Satan's plan. He does not want aged men. 
He doesn't want aged women able to teach and encourage and strengthen and give younger women direction. He wants them to flounder around. Satan's will is that people are ignorant, they don't know, they haven't come to the knowledge of the truth, and he can manipulate them and have them at his disposal, taken captive by him at his will. Now, a lot of people, and I thank God, there's some people here today that maybe are second generation Christians, or maybe third or fourth, but there's a lot of people today who have baggage. I can't help but think about old uh, Dionysius back in Acts 17, living out there by the Areopagus. And he hears Paul preaching. His life consisted, his very name, that Dionysius was the Greek name for the Roman god Bacchus, the god of perversion, filth, and wickedness. That's what his upbringing was. That's what it consisted of. And he heard Paul preaching of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. And as there's redemption in Christ Jesus, like, that's what I need. And he trusted on the spot, right at Mars Hill, trusting. There's a lot of people today who have a lifestyle associated the same thing with Dionysius. Darkness from their very birth. No one ever read them the Bible. No one ever taught them, Jesus loves me when they're little. They hear... ACDC may be rocking them to bed in more ways than one. But whether it be someone that had a lifestyle where their family or their husband and wife or their father and mother loved them and nurtured them, or someone that had a terrible, destructive upbringing, you think about uh, Jephthah back in Judges chapter 11. What, I mean, what did he have? Here he comes out. It was nothing of his will. He was a son of a heart. He couldn't. You know, I, I asked this one doctor one time, he bought a six-wheeler from me, I said, hey, what's the key to longevity? He says, pick your parents. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks, that one. Never mind. But here's old Jephthah. He couldn't pick his parents. He didn't have any choice. Here he comes into the world with that stigma, son of an harlot. But God was able to fortify and strengthen him that he could become a mighty man of valor. Sure, he had a bad past. He had, God could take that wounded little vessel that was damaged and broken and cracked and allow his might to allow him to be a mighty man of valor to work fabulous and phenomenal things with the nation Israel. He could judge the nation and keep them on track. So it doesn't matter if you have an upbringing that was impeccable from godly parents and thank the Lord if you do. If you don't have baggage and your, your testimony consists of I disobeyed mom and dad and, you know, something. Something that you think, oh, well, that was nothing. Well, thank the Lord for that. Amen. But if you have a sordid past and you have all sorts of baggage, well, hey, don't worry, God can use that too. He's able to save by many and he's able to save by few. He has no problem working in that. He can work with that material without any problem. So when we're going thinking about aged men and aged women, remember Timothy, or no, uh, yeah, Timothy. Timothy, I don't read anywhere about Timothy's father being godly, laboring in the word and doctrine. I don't hear any peep of that. But we hear about a godly mother and a godly grandmother, and they were pouring into that little boy, that little son that Lois had, and that little grandson, you know, I see, I think I got it right. They're pouring into him the scriptures, and that from a child he was able to know the holy scriptures, which were able to make him wise unto salvation. So he could go to Dalmatia, or he could have like Titus going to Crete, that horrible, horrible place. And he could set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city, as I have commanded. And out comes order and godliness out of a nation or a city that was chaotic and full of decadence and despair. Well, hey, you look around today, it's the same type of scenario you see in Joppa, or you saw back in at the Dionysius or the Areopagite and about in, in Greece and those places, we're running into the same type of flavor and thermometer reading that was going on back there. And what's the solution? The same method and the same message that the Apostle Paul preached. And when he says, be ye followers of me, oh, we can learn something there. How did the Apostle Paul think? How did he minister? How did he allow his life to be given for the saints? He was willing to spend and be spent for them. Amen. And he did it all for a temporary reward? No, he did it for Christ's glory. And not only was it rewarding and beneficial in this temporal life, but also in that which is to come. So thank the Lord for examples like Jephthah, whether it be Barak or Timothy. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you have problems, well, hey, God is able to take up those pieces. I met a guy one time, he grew up in Chicago, had no clue who his father was. No clue. 
that he trusted Christ as his Savior. He says, now I know I have a Father in Heaven that loves me, cares for me. He didn't even know who his physical father was. He didn't care for him, left him, abandoned him. But thanks be to God that he'll never leave us or forsake us. And then salvation of his flesh and of his bones. You can't beat that type of closeness. So thank the Lord for that. So I love those examples. So when you look at uh, the example, who remembers when Moses, God gives Moses information to come down and liberate the nation Israel. Remember those two guys that withstood Moses? It doesn't say it in Exodus. But here they come, greatly withstanding the words that Moses was speaking. Now it doesn't say it in Exodus, but it says it in, I think it's 2 Timothy. Well, let's go over that. Um, yeah, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, I think this is the right one. Now I should not, my, my goal is to not increase the color in my face. So hopefully I have all these references correct. I'm losing pages. The Word of God is not done. All right, in... In 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And thanks be to God, this book gives us an understanding of how Satan thinks and his plans and allows us just like a trap. You set a snare for an animal, you try to make it hidden so the thing doesn't know what's going on. So just like if you're walking along and you see a snare, you see a board with a bunch of nails in it, you try to notice it, you identify it, and you walk around and you avoid it. And Satan doesn't want people to see and avoid his plan, but thank God that he gives us his understanding. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's look at verse number 6. It says, For this sort are they which creep into houses, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. There's a lot of those in America. There's a lot of those in Europe. And when those late, well, women, females, Hear the gospel, those are ones that can, I mean, they can have their lives changed too. It says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jannies and Jambres, what did they do to Moses? They withstood Moses. They stood in opposition and they greatly withstood his words. He says, they withstood Moses. So do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the truth but that they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be made manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. So what was the solution for Jannies and Jamborees? God's truth being unleashed. The people understood God was a true and living God, and their, their plan and their, their desire was foiled. So that withstanding the truth is nothing new. We, we heard a little bit last night about the Apostle Paul. He was given, just like Moses, information to gather and to instruct a certain class of people. Moses ran into great opposition. The Apostle Paul, we talked about the beatings, the whippings, all the resistance that he ran into because Satan was trying to either corrupt or to shut down that message. He knew how powerful it was and wanted to be shut down in its infancy. And thanks be to God, you can't. Out it came. The more it was crushed, the more it came forward. Now, there's a few things that Satan uses. He tries to withstand the words. Another thing is de crippling and debilitating. If you want to go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. Well, you probably don't have to go anywhere to get there. And we'll look at verse number 3. 2 Timothy 2, 3. Well, we're right there next to the, the reference that sounds like you're playing trains. So we'll look at 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, which says, these, uh, And these things thou hast, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to who? Faithful men. Faithful men who shall be able to do what? Faithful. Teach others all. Uh oh, these are dangerous people. These are people that know the information. They're living epistles known and read, and when someone has some evil thing to say of them, the allegations can't stick because they're known by what they do. These people are known and read of all men. He says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now those soldiers, David's mighty men back in the Old Testament, they weren't people wasting time they were crafting their skills. If you remember those guys back in the Old Testament, they could sling stones within a hair's breadth and not miss? That is some V 
very accurate folks. I mean, I've, I've tried those slings before and I'd be hard to even hit a vehicle, let alone a hair's breadth. But those people were, they were cunning. Just, I was talking with one of the fellows today about playing musical instruments. You've got the people who can, like me, can maybe get a couple of chords out and kind of slob around on it. But then you've got the people who can play with understanding. They can play with cunning understanding and they can play those things like a masterpiece. And God's plan is that every single one of us, that He's chosen to be a soldier to be able to fulfill that position and war, a good warfare without being entangled. You remember that term, it's entanglement, uh, Pharaoh mentioned it about Israel. And he was hoping that they're going to be entangled in the wilderness so he could catch them. Slow them down. It didn't necessarily stop them, but something that can slow down the work of the ministry. And if you look at who's in the target, <clears throat> if you can have a godly husband, and then the godly husband, he teaches his wife to be godly, they have children, and they train and instruct those children. Well, before you know it, you can have an assembly that's fortified and fit for the battle. Remember old uh, Abraham, when Lot and his stuff got all taken and hijacked and hauled away, Abraham took his trained servants, born in his own house, and they went out there and fought and they got the stuff back. And we can learn something from that today. God's will is that every child that He blesses us with, they're trained and they're fortified so they can be a soldier underneath a godly father and a godly mother. They can go out, they know what to do, they can win the battle and fight for Christ's sake. And if you look in our text here in 2 Timothy 2, if you're still there, how do you know what to do? How do you know how to war? Verse 7, the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. That's the key. We can have understanding in all things through that. So who's in the spotlight? Who's in the target that Satan is after most of all in a family? Sure, you can have an ungodly woman. I don't, I don't know if we mentioned last night about Ahab and his wife. He didn't need the devil helping along. His wife did a fabulous job. I mean, she was pretty much just Satan in the flesh. When he was coveting, we heard a good message today about being content with what such things as you have. He wanted Nabal's vineyard. He couldn't get it. He's pouting and all sad. And Jezebel's like, why are you all sad? What do you need? Oh, I can't get the guy's vineyard. I can do that. Forge some documents. Set Nabal up on how to save blasphemy and put him to death. Murdered him in cold blood. How horrible is that? But what do you learn? You can learn from experience, we have to be careful for those kind of things. So, who is in the spotlight? Who's in the target? Godly men. So you look at some of the things that godly men, to have an aged man, we looked at, to have an aged man, well ideally the goal for a young man isn't to be rich and have new trucks and cars and gold and silver and be able to watch the Super Bowl or whatever. The goal for a godly young man and the goal to train them is so that they can have qualifications, they can have fortifications, to be able to fulfill, fulfill the position in the assembly as being an elder, a bishop, or a deacon, they haven't squandered their lives, they've invested them for the sake of Christ, so when they get to an age, they can fulfill those roles, ideally, that God would have them to fill. And that's what should be our, our goal or our target to be able to do. If you go over to a few, we'll look at a few things that the target is on for men to take them out of the ministry, to allow them to swerve, to turn aside a vain jangling, to have him be shipwrecked, or be like Demas, when he says, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. We can learn from these examples, and you go by those snares, and say, oh, brother so-and-so got snared by that thing. We can learn from that experience and avoid that thing. So let's go over to Galatians chapter number 5. In Galatians 5, we'll look at a few of these things here. Galatians 5. Now, what time do we need to stop yeah. Uh, eight. Okay. Eight fifteen. All right. Let's. I think we can do this. Here we go. I'll try not to start talking like the auctioneer. Oh, 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 oh. I'm trying to be. I know listening fast is something. Eight fifteen. Okay. There's something to talking fast, but if you can't understand it, it, it's, it profited you nothing. All right. We're going over to Galatians five. Galatians. Galatians 5, and let's pick up with verse number 7. Verse 7 of Galatians 6, it says, Ye did, that's past tense, ye did run well, who did hinder you? 
that you should not obey the truth. Now today, young men being targeted. Now a young man, ideally, usually, usually, a young man is looking for a godly young lady. And when you look, when you remember back about Jezebel, someone that's not a godly lady does a very good job at detouring the direction and path of a godly man. They can take them and they don't even know and all of a sudden like Samson with Delilah. And before you know it, Samson couldn't control what he saw with his eyes. And before you know it, his enemies took that hot iron. And I can't imagine how that had to be painful. But they put out his eyes with that hot iron. Those eyes that once he couldn't control, that were beholding harlots down at Timnath and places like that. The eyes that he couldn't control, they got controlled with that hot iron. Never again to be able to see anything. And that's why the wages of sin, it looks great and it looks like it's pleasurable, yeah, for a season, and it starts paying more than you ever, ever wanted to reap. Those people that are loading their ships up, they're living the dream or whatever the term is, and they're loading those ships up, sending them off to sea, those ships are going to come back. And when they start coming back, they're like, oh no, I thought I was going to get away with that stuff. No. The Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's Galatians 6, 7. You can't beat it. That sowing and reaping principle is positive for good, but you sow to the flesh and it reaps negative things that you wish you, you, wish you could play, pray for crop failure, but it doesn't work. Alright, so in Galatians 5, let's keep going down here. He says, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you, a... A whole bunch of leaven, no, it says a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. That's dangerous. Now, a good way, too. You could have a believer, a godly man, that's working at a job. You've got a hundred lost people in profanity and decadence, and they got their perversion and pornography up on their little uh, toolboxes and stuff. One good implement, and using leaven as a positive thing, but a little bit of association of a godly person can have massive and positive results among darkness, amongst that, that heathen, amongst that horrible society. And that's why God's work can fortify us. And if the Apostle Paul himself prayed, he said, pray for me that with all boldness, as always, I make known the mystery of the gospel. Well, then who are we to think that we don't need to pray for boldness too? And encourage one another to be bold. Amen. And ideally have some examples and epistles that are willing to go out there and charge for Christ's sake and be able to go out in a public position. Sing and preach and glorify and lift up Christ's name where it should be lifted up. Amen. I don't remember who it was, but they talked about truth had fallen in the street and equity could not enter. Well, it's about time we take the truth out in the street and put it back up where it belongs. Amen. So people who are on their way, just like back in the Old Testament, those people who were bit by those fiery serpents, they're poisoned, they're dying, that venom is going through their blood, they're breathing their last breath. And they said, look and live. And they're willing to look up and live. And they were healed. And how God likens that in John chapter 3 to that serpent. As Moses lift up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up. Up high upon Calvary's cross, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. And when he cried, he didn't say, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Godhead being severed to make a way that our sins could be forgiven. Amen. And thanks be to God. God, it talks about in Psalm 22, all God's billows and his waves fell upon Christ Jesus. Not only was the wrath of God upon him, but of course the wrath of man. And a great picture of that is the ark. The first waters that came against the ark were from below, and then the waters from above, and Christ being that picture of the ark, man's vengeance and his wrath against that ark being a picture of Christ, and then the Father's wrath coming down upon the Son. And so that the people who could enter in could be safe to that one door. When he said in John 14, 6, I am a way, no, the way, the definite article, the way, the truth, and the life. So in Galatians 5, we read about a little leaven at, leaven at the whole lump, and we need to be very careful. Someone had mentioned about what parents uh, tolerate, or what they will tolerate, the next generation will embrace. And we need to be very careful as godly men, or as little men, future godly men, or future godly husband, be very careful what kind of leaven goes in your eyes, and what leaven goes in your ears. When Jesus warned, he said, be careful what you hear, and take heed how you hear. Well, why? 
Your equilibrium and your balance is in your ears. When you start hearing things of the contrary, it goes in and it can start affecting you, so be very careful what you hear. We're going to look at the end of this message regarding uh, the withdraw from those brethren who walk disorderly. You withdraw, you disconnect, you shun them because they can affect you in a negative way. Now let's take the Bible again. We'll go over to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians 5, this book can give us understanding and even though the term judgment is looked at as a negative type of sense today, judging, I talked to a guy out in, out in uh, Montana one time, it was the cherry season. And I mentioned to the guy, and he looked like a typical retired college professor. And I come up and I said, wow, there's a lot of discrimination that goes on around this, uh, the produce section. He goes, I do not discriminate. He goes over and picks up a bag of cherries that were rotten and bad and moldy, puts them in his cart, and he goes off. Well, he made his point, but I'm almost positive he is not going to engage in eating those cherries when he gets home. He's going to discard those things. But we need to be able to make discernments. What's something that's good and positive? What's not? Throw that other stuff out. And that's why we need to be very careful what goes in our eyes and our ears. Because not only does it affect us, someone who had gone through Aiken. I don't remember who it was, but that's the beauty of it. You forget the messenger, but you remember the message. But Aiken sin, someone who went into a great house, it didn't just affect him. It affected Nick. When God says, Israel hath sinned. It was just Achan that sinned, but it affected the whole nation. And when a godly man starts making place, giving place to the devil, and a little leaven entering into his thoughts, and unreigned thoughts and emotions, it can start affecting him and his children and other people, and we need to be very careful for that. And not being ignorant of Satan's devices, because he's a crafty one. He makes those Gibeonites look like child's play. <clears throat> Alright, in Ephesians chapter number 5. In Ephesians 5, let's look at verse number 6. Ephesians 5, verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of dis disobedience. Be ye not therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. Now, when I was talking about broken vessels, some men here today... You maybe trusted Christ later on in life. Or you got saved when you were younger, and then you dabble and get sucked into the world and finally got pulled out of there. And you have all sorts of baggage. I was mentioning to different people, and they'll mention to me, they hear all these sounds and the sense, and they engage in these things that aren't God's will. And after they get saved, they'll be at a restaurant. And over the speakers, one chord strings off of that guitar with those satanic ministers, and down into their mind floods, people, places, flavors, all these things come down like, oh, they're plagued. And let that be a lesson for younger people. The pleasures of sin don't even go. Learn from the biblical examples. You don't have to go and break the, your head on the same limbs going through the, the darkness. You can learn from other believers. But those things, once they're in there, it's so easy to chart a revival. When Israel, they left the bondage of Egypt... Out they come, redeemed by blood, and miracle, the water is standing upright as in a heap. They were frozen up there, and they go through, and then they get to the other side, and they're all like, oh, God put us in the wilderness. We remember the leeks and the garlics and the onions. You're willing to go back under bondage, and it says that Pharaoh and his army and that made them serve with rigor. Oh, well, okay, we'll serve with rigor, but as long as you give us some garlics and some onions and some leeks. It makes no sense at all. It's not even rational. But that's the deceitfulness of sin. They're ready to go back because they had a couple of pieces of food. That is just lunacy. All right, let's go over to... Uh, well, with this thought, we don't have to go over there, but this thing about godly men being not deceived, but you were in darkness. In, Pro or in Psalms chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful... Now I messed it up. Sorry about that. Standeth in the way of sinners? Yep. Yes, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. And it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now I don't have to tell... I mean, I'm not going to be real blunt or anything. It's, it's not going to be R-rated at all. But men, 
we've seen things, whether whether it be in things that are hidden and like stuff that's kind of whittled away, or if it's just billboards with decadence on it, we've seen things, we've seen images and things like that, and those things can come back, but what do we need to do? Casting down imaginations. Amen. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You can't help but have some thought roll through your mind, but you never give it any heed. You don't sit and yield to it and muse about all the leaks. You cast that thing down. Yeah. I think about it, you know, I don't, I've never done a whole lot of fishing for muskie, but you know, you have the big crankbait and you put it in there and whoosh, you whip that big hunk of wood out there with the big treble hooks and you, but casting down, I think of it like an imagination. Here comes an imagination. You take your big Zebco 202 or whatever you got, whoosh, you wing that thought out there, and when it gets all the way to the end, cut the string off and throw the rod and reel in the lake, never to bring it up again. You don't make provision for the flesh because let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Amen. And it goes to any gender. I mean, it, you, it's not only one gender specific these days. There are people that claim they have no gender, whatever that foolishness is. But we need to be careful what goes in our eyes, ears, noses, and mouths. Any, any part of our body, we need to be careful. All right, we're going over to Romans chapter 13. In Romans 13, I'm going to try to pick up the piece. Romans 13, and let's look at verse number 14. Romans 13, 14. Well, 13, 13. Here's the cure for rebellion. You know, 13 being the number of rebellion. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riotous or drunkenness, not in chambering or wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and what, those ne what are those next words? Make no provision. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Don't give it any little slap. Because your flesh, if you give it a little bit, it's going to take more. And that's why the pleasures of sin will never satisfy. Right. If, you can, if you can come to the understanding, the pleasures of sin, they're not going to satisfy. You might get a little feeling, a little tingle, and it's going to take more and more and more, and you're never going to be satisfied. And just like you read about those horrible Manson and Bundy and all those mass murderers, they started engaging in decadence and they couldn't control their thoughts and their emotions. And it got more and more like a snowball going down the mountainside till it led them to the edge of sin where it was into destroying life and just horrible stuff they're engaged in. How did they get there? They made provision for the flesh. They allowed the lasciviousness, unrestrained passions and lust, and those imaginations to start flaring up. If you want to take your Bible, uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And you all are familiar with this thing about the time. And it's always good to remember that we are like calendars. Our days are numbered. So we need to, we need to number our days and make sure we use them and invest them for something good. In Ephesians chapter 5... And look at verse number 15. Ephesians 5, 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Now, circumspectly, what do you think about when you hear about circum? You think about a circle, something that's circular. So as you're walking circumspectly, you're aware of what's around you. Now, muggers and stuff like that in big cities, they're looking for people who are not aware of this. They're not circumspect. And if you're walking, not being circumspect, you're walking in a position where you can be a victim that fast. Because those people who are preying on those people, they're looking for people who aren't paying attention. People who aren't going like this and looking around, looking under people's cars and stuff. People who are aware, they're not going to be an easy target and they're usually avoiding to look for someone else that's simple. So walking circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. For men, women, boy and girl, especially for younger people today, younger, younger men, younger women, you are, right now have more time, more idle time or extra time than you probably ever have the rest of your life. And if you could take those extra hours and invest them into memorizing scripture, studying and reading and talking to older saints and getting understanding and guidance, that will give you wisdom that you could, it has a value you can never even put a monetary value on. That will guide you, I am glad, and it's nothing I'm tooting my own horn, but after I trusted Christ as my Savior, my schedule allowed me where I could study and read for four hours in the morning, 
and then four hours before I went to sleep. And it was a sacrifice, but to be able to fortify and have God's Word dwelling in me to a greater extent than I would have if I couldn't, it sure has kept me from a lot of things that I could have gotten into. And it ruined me. Here's a perfect, easy opportunity just to go into sin, and it's just wide open, and here comes Bible verses, spoiling that nice opportunity. And thanks be to God. Here it comes. Everything's set up, and then here comes the word. Make not for oh, That's right. And it keeps you on that straight and narrow, and thanks be to God, because that's what his book does. That's right. I mean, I, I, I have to stay on track because I'm going to get too sidetracked. Now, this thing about idle time, invest that time. Take your Bibles and go to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16, you probably know where I'm going. And Ezekiel 16, we'll look at verse number 49. Ezekiel 16, 49. Now we all know that down in Sodom and Gomorrah, they, won't, they weren't known for having Bible studies. They weren't known for being prudes or things like that. They were known for being decadent and being proud of them. So verse 49 in Ezekiel 16, it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. What's the first one? Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor needy, and they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Here comes that autoclave from the sky, rain down upon Sodom and Gomorrah, Adam and Zeboam, and those cities about them in like matter, and cleaned their clock and purified that vacuum. But how did they get that way? Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. So many young men, so many young ladies, they have an abundance of time. And usually really bad things happen as you start losing apparel. And I'm not going to get into any graphic detail, but so many people kind of experiment and they're kind of dabbling around in things that they know aren't right. And that's why God talks about secret parts as secret parts. They're for husbands and wives, they have their purpose, but not to be, the best thing is to have, like when uh, God clothed Adam and Eve, He gave them bikinis of skin? No, He gave them coats of skin to cover them up. Amen. And bad things happen when you start losing your apparel. When women's clothes, they start losing them, or they get so tight that they almost lost them, it's just like having colored skin, bad things happen. People's minds go the wrong way and they start snowballing towards bad direction. And what's the cure for that? Anyone know the cure for that? Modest apparel. Oh, what a wonderful thing that is. So God has a solution to all these things. So this thing about abundance of idleness, we need to be very careful with that. Take your Bible and go back to Jeremiah. Go back a little ways to Jeremiah chapter number 5. These were written for our learning and admonition. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians 10, 5, I believe. In Jeremiah chapter 5, and the Old Testament, it can get very graphic. It strips away the veneer of sin and leaves it clear as day. Like, oh, that's where that little uh, candy eye sin leads? Uh-huh. And if you're a note-taker, you can read Ezekiel chapter 23 on your own. And it's graphic, and it's crude, and it's rough, but everyone needs to be familiar with the stuff in Ezekiel 30, or 23. In Jeremiah chapter 5 is where we're going. Jeremiah 5, look with me at verse number 7. Jeremiah 5, 7, he says, How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me, and sworn by them that are no gods. When I had fed them to the full, they committed adultery, and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. Ooh, God's blessing of food and nourishment was given to them, and they had that pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idols, and did they glorify God and say, thank you for this food, help us to utilize the energy to glorify you. They assembled themselves by troops at the harlot's houses. How can it get that way? Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness in any of our lives, and we're going that direction. No matter who you think you are, that's where you go with unrestrained passions and lust. So the solution of it, look at verse number 14, Jeremiah 5, 14. When Jeremiah was kind of fence straddling, and he he was, you look at here, verse number 14, he says, um, Therefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. 
What did he do? He let them go? No, with love and compassion, he put God's truth upon them. When you think about the, Dan, the, the Danites, where they're dwelling, they dwelt at ease. They didn't need buildings, they didn't need uh, a barricade, not barricade, but they didn't have to have a, a walls around their city. They dwelt at ease, they weren't afraid of anything. They had pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. And that's that one, I think I mentioned it last night, about that guy that brought his concubine, they're going to stay overnight. And the Danites had the pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness, they dwelt at ease. And it says in Judges 17, there is no magistrate in that city to put them to shame for what they are doing. And that's why every single day, every one of us, regardless of age, need to open up this book. And if our hearts and our minds are strained, it needs to put us to shame every single day. And keep us on the way that we ought to go for the greater glory of God. And when you stray from this book, that's where you start going. And that's why we need to keep that mem that um, solidified in our mind. We don't have to go there, but in Exodus chapter 23 and verse number 2, it says, You shall not follow a multitude to do evil. Everyone is doing it. <laughs> well, that's not a, that's an indictment. In Exodus 23, verse 2, if everyone's doing it, then you ought not be doing it. I heard this one guy, he says, if it feels good, quit it. I mean, to some extent, when the way the world is speaking, there's validity to that. But we need to be careful about those things. All right, now let's go over to, uh, let's go for our next verse over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, how many people you've ever been by a truck stop? You're filling up fuel and you hear this awful sound of psh, 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 psh. You're like, what is that? When I was young, I thought, what is that thing? It's the air brake system purging corrosive and dangerous materials out of the system. Constantly, all day long. They're going down the road, psh, psh. They're getting rid of that stuff that could be toxic and hazardous to rust out the brake drums or whatever all the air brakes work. I'm not... I specifically bought a bus with wet brakes, not air brakes, because I don't know all about it. But anyway, being as it may be, those air brakes, they're purging out things that can be dangerous. Now, in 2 Timothy, let me get over there. 2 Timothy chapter 2, there's a purging that God has for the believer. Oh, and it can keep your mind and heart free from those corrosive and damaging elements. Let's, let me get over there. Sorry, I'm running my lips and not going over there finding the verse myself. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and let's look at verse number 20. 2 Timothy 2, verse 20. It says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore, what's that word? Purge. Purge, Purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meat, something that's fitting for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. I don't know of anyone in here today that doesn't long for that, to be that, uh, where's that verse here, every, uh, uh, a, a vessel unto sanctification and honor, meat for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. I think that's probably everyone's heart cry here today. And that's why this book can keep us having that right mindset and going toward that direction. So every day, now, when I was looking at this verse a while back, I go by and you hear those air brakes purging. It's a reminder. And I love doing those kind of things. If you can think of something you're going to see almost every day integrated with a certain biblical principle, a certain flavor, a certain food you eat every day, you can integrate that with a certain biblical principle. So every day you're reminding yourself, keeping it close into your mind. And that's something that's very beneficial. Oh, we're already past 8 o'clock. All right, well, let me get wrapping this up here. Let's, uh, uh, let me zing this down a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to do a little, uh, a little uh, shaving off here. Uh, okay, so I'm not pausing for effect. Sorry about that, but all right. Uh, let me just, I'll consolidate a few things here. We mentioned a little bit about when you're youth. You've got a surplus of time. You may not think you do. Just like younger men. They're like, oh, if I found a wife, huh? then, then I'm going to learn about child, child reasoning. You need to take the scripture and find out what a godly wife is. What a godly wife is not. Talk to some aged women and say, hey, 
What are some good character traits that you have noticed in your life that happens to be a little longer than mine? And learn and glean some of these truths. Young men, what do you do? Memorize verses, what a godly woman consists of. I would highly recommend memorizing the material in Proverbs chapter 31. Know that stuff like the back of your hand so you never make a decision only with your eye. Oh, wow, look at that. I'm going to marry in haste and repent in leisure. Don't do that. So many people have done that and they're like, was I? What a fool. And they're kind of like, oh, I'm like this kind of thing. But be able to, with the right mindset, with good advice, make war. Same thing with women. I mean, I, I got married kind of later on in life. And I'll talk to some people that they were younger than I was when I got married. They're like, oh, I'm funny. And they're all nervous. I'm thinking, that you had plenty of time. <laughs> just, just make sure that you put your concern towards pleasing God. And lo and behold, you probably might find a gal that's willing to please God. You can serve God arm in arm. Hey. But if you're out searching for, I mean, this gal, you might just find what your heart desires and it's something that you're going to wish that you didn't get. So you have to be very careful. Walking circumspectly, not as fools, but as wives. But as you're younger, if you don't, you're not married, you don't have children, children take up a fair amount of time. And that's great. It's part of the investment. Investing your life, your treasures, your talents into those youth so they can be those little warriors to go out and do what's right. But as an outlet, you know, you need some power. You're going to run a blender at your house. You plug into the wall and there's a surplus of power to power your blender, whatever you may need. Now is the time in your youth to load up and fortify yourself. Memorize while your memory is sharp. Memorize the Word of God. Hide it in your heart. When David the psalmist in Psalm 119, after he had his bout with Bathsheba and he actually got his mind thinking straight, when he learned, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. When he learned his lesson with Bathsheba, he saw the little child in anguish and dying right before his very eyes. That truth of, oh, if only I didn't do it, if only I would have guarded my eyes. But he learned, when you read Psalm 101, and verse number 3, when David, with that stuff behind him, realized that's wrong and not going back, he said with the understanding, he said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Amen. He said, I hate the work of them that turn aside. He wasn't sitting down in his house watching entertainment that was glorifying perversion and decadence and using God's name in vain. He shut that stuff off and he said he would walk within his house with a, with a pure heart. Uh, and he goes on. And so you can read Psalm 101 on your own leisure. But that's a very important thing. When David learned his lesson, when those other opportunities came, he's like, absolutely no. I'm going to please the one who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So take that time and be careful what's going in there. Uh, I, I don't want to tell too many stories about myself. Let's see. We're going to... Okay, we have, what, nine minutes maybe? If we went to eight, fourteen. Uh, myself, I think about going to exits. And I was thinking in my own life to be careful what example I leave. My dad, he had two motorbikes growing up. One didn't work and one did work. And he put on, I don't know, maybe... 15,000 miles, maybe not even that much. So then I see motorbikes and his little uh, desire to them. Well, then here I come along with like 21 of them and over 300,000 miles under my belt. I'm like, ooh, is Violet going to be riding a million miles? <laughs> She's going to have flocks of it. You know. But you have to be careful because what one gen, and that's just kind of a silly, something that's not really detrimental per se. And, I thank God for those safe miles. I got to use them to the greater glory of God to some extent. But you have to be careful because what one generation will tolerate, the next one may take it farther than you ever thought they were going to take it. And we need to be really careful for that and the examples that we leave for them. And that's why if you go to, uh, I think we're just going to have to run over to there and then we have to shut it down. In Titus chapter number 2. I know this one was hit a little bit. But this is the sobriety. This is the understanding that God's Word can give us. In Titus chapter 2, look with me at verse number 7. And here is the safest thing that you could ever do. Titus 2, verse 7. In some things... In all things. Oh! In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. That means when there's eyes looking at you or no eyes looking at you. When you're by yourself, some husbands have to travel. There's nobody around that they know. 
And here comes the temptation, the blinking light signs, or all this junk and decadence around. We need to be able to say, like Sarai I said, Thou God seest me. Back, I believe it's Genesis 16. Thou God seest me. To be able to control our imaginations and intents of our heart, for not just for our sake, but also for the children or anyone that we may know and run into. We need to be those living epistles, known and read of all men. So in Titus 2, 7, it says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil things to say of him. And then it goes on about not purloining, but being a good example. And then we'll read verse number 12, and then we'll have to stop, because now we're going way past our time. Almost. It says, um, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise them. So that's what God's plan is. Not being ignorant of Satan's devices, Satan's devices attack the husband, attack the family, attack future husbands, attack future wives. Try to have them tainted in all sorts of baggage on them. God's plan is for young men, young ladies to be trained. They can grow up to be people who are able to be fortified. They can teach the children and they can grow up to be those aged men and aged women that our assemblies and that this nation needs so drastically. It's in despair. And to find aged women these days that are able to instruct the younger women in common sense and things like that, there's not, it's sad to say, there's not as many around that there should be. Because Satan's out there picking them off. So I pray that every single one of us aren't going to get picked up. And this year, if, if God, if he, tear, if he, he doesn't return the next year, we all are able to come back, that we don't have all this baggage and wounds and stuff with our cause, we can be able to come together and every one of us fortify even greater children with greater understanding, more scriptures memorized, more hymns memorized, and fortified for when those hard times come. Because Job of old is a wonderful example Esteeming the words of God more than his necessary food. Amen. That's the way, that's the key to success. No matter how hard things get, you have those kind of, your desire, your goal is set on that, and you're able to succeed. So, we'll, uh, we'll close in a word of prayer, and then we'll be on with the rest of the night. Lord, we sure are thankful for the wisdom that you've given us. Thank you for this book, and thank you for able ministers. Thank you for aged men and aged women that are able to help us and teach us and instruct us. Help us all to be able to keep ourselves in check and not ever think ourselves lofty and never able to commit or get into certain sins. But may we realize the potential is there and may we battle it with your word dwelling in us richly every single day for your greater glory and magnificence and honor that you'd receive those things that you deserve in this world and also that which is to come. Thank you for this time that we can muse and meditate upon your word. Help us to ruminate upon it the rest of our lives and ponder it and add to it. We thank you for your fidelity and may we too be able to exemplify fidelity and righteousness and godliness in this world every day of our life for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.